Imagine this. You've just become aware that a disaster is unfolding. Your adrenaline spikes. What do you do? Let's break it down. The first 10 minutes are crucial. The clock is ticking and every second counts. You must take immediate action to assess the situation. Is it a natural disaster? A societal collapse? An invasion? Understanding the nature and scale of the emergency is critical to determining your next steps. Now let's talk about immediate threats. These are the dangers that require your attention right now. For instance, if there's an earthquake, you'll want to duck and cover away from windows and heavy furniture. If it's a flood, you'll need to move to higher ground. Your immediate response should always be geared towards ensuring your personal safety. But don't let the stress of the situation cloud your judgment. Panicking can lead to rash decisions that might put you in more danger. Instead, take a deep breath, gather your thoughts, and make rational decisions. Remember your survival instincts are there to help you, not hinder you. Once you've assessed the situation and ensured your personal safety, you can start to think about the bigger picture. What will you need to survive the next hour, the next day, the next week? This is where your preparedness plans come into play. But we'll dive into that in our next scene. For now, focus on those first 10 minutes. They're the most chaotic, the most uncertain, but also the most crucial. They set the tone for how you'll handle the rest of the crisis. So, think fast, act fast, but most importantly, act smart. Remember, the first step to survival is to stay alive, prioritize your safety above all else. You've survived the initial shock. Now it's time to get organized and implement your emergency plan. Imagine this. The immediate danger has passed and you found a safe space. Your first instinct? Reach out to your loved ones. Whether it's your spouse at work, kids at school, or parents across town, you need to know they're safe. Establishing contact with family members is crucial at this stage. You might use a pre-decided communication system like a set of coded text messages or a designated point of contact. Remember, the goal is to confirm everyone's safety and coordinate your actions. Now let's talk about the SHTF plan, your blueprint for survival. No two disasters are the same and your response needs to be flexible, but having a plan gives you a head start. It's like a roadmap guiding you through the chaos. It's time to activate that plan. Do you have a designated meeting spot? Time to head there. Do you have an emergency kit? Grab it. Does everyone in your family know their role? Make sure they do. In this hour, your actions set the tone for the rest of your survival journey. You're not merely reacting anymore. You're taking proactive steps to ensure your safety and the safety of your loved ones. You're assessing your resources, establishing contact with your team, and putting your plan into action. But remember, communication isn't just about talking, it's about listening too. It's about staying informed and adapting your plan as the situation evolves. Is there a safer location you can reach? Is there a community response you can join? Are there updates about the disaster that change your priorities? Stay connected, stay informed. Effective communication and swift action can make all the difference during a crisis. This is your mantra for the first hour. Your ability to communicate effectively and put your plan into action can be the difference between panic and preparedness, between chaos and control, between merely surviving and successfully navigating the crisis. The first 24 hours are critical. Your focus should be on securing your basic needs and staying informed. Now let's dive into the specifics. Water, food, and shelter are the three pillars of survival. Without access to clean water, an individual can only survive for about three days. Therefore, securing a water source should be your first priority. If you have stored water, start rationing it. If you haven't, start looking for a source immediately. Remember, boiling water can kill most pathogens and make it safe to drink. Next, you need to ensure that you have enough food. Ideally, you would have emergency food supplies stocked up. If not, try to gather as much food as you can. Prioritize high-energy, non-perishable items. And remember, rationing is key. You don't know how long the crisis will last, so it's important to make your supplies last as long as possible. Shelter is the third pillar. If you're at home, you're in luck. But if you're not, you need to find a safe place to stay. This could be a designated emergency shelter, a friend's house, or even a makeshift shelter in the wilderness. The important thing is to stay protected from the elements and any potential dangers. Now, let's talk about staying informed. In a crisis, information is power. You need to know what's happening, what's expected to happen, and what you should do. Tune into local radio stations, check online sources if you can, and pay attention to community signals. These could be sirens, loudspeakers, or even word of mouth. Do your best to separate fact from rumor, and always listen to official advisories. In these crucial hours, securing your basic needs and staying informed 
can greatly increase your chances of survival. Remember, the key is to stay calm, stay focused, and make every second count. The next 48 hours will involve reinforcement and reevaluation, but for now, concentrate on the immediate tasks at hand. The first 24 hours will lay the groundwork for your survival in the days to come. As the second day dawns, it's time to fortify your defenses and reassess your resource needs. This stage is all about reinforcement and reevaluation, a crucial pivot point in your survival journey. First, let's talk about fortifying your shelter. Now that you've had some time to settle into your safe space, you'll want to assess it with a critical eye. Look for any vulnerabilities that could be exploited by the elements or other potential threats. Are there any cracks in the walls? Are the doors and windows secure? Is your shelter insulated enough to protect you from extreme temperatures? Once you've identified these weak points, use whatever materials you have at hand to reinforce them. Remember, a sturdy shelter is not just about keeping you safe from immediate danger, it also plays a vital role in maintaining your health and morale over an extended period. Next, it's time to reassess your resource needs. This involves taking a thorough inventory of your supplies. How much food and water do you have left? What about medical supplies? Do you have enough fuel for your cooking and heating needs? Once you've assessed your stockpile, it's time to plan ahead. If your initial estimates suggest that your resources might not last as long as the crisis, it's time to come up with a procurement strategy. This could involve rationing your supplies more strictly, scavenging for resources, or even bartering with others if it's safe to do so. Reevaluation also means staying informed about the crisis. Keep tuning in to any available news sources to get a sense of how long the situation might last. This will help you adjust your plans accordingly. By the end of day two, you should have a firm grasp on your situation and be prepared for a potentially prolonged crisis. This is not the time for complacency. It's the time for action, adaptation, and anticipation. Your ability to survive and thrive in this new reality depends on your willingness to reinforce, reassess, and adapt. So stay vigilant, stay resourceful, and above all, stay determined. As day three sets in, it's time to start thinking long term. The initial shock may have subsided, but the reality of the situation is just beginning to sink in. Survival is no longer about getting through the next few hours or days, but potentially weeks, months, or even longer. This is the point where you need to go beyond the immediate and consider the bigger picture. It's time to expand your safety net. If it's safe and feasible, reach out to your neighbors or other nearby survivors. Establishing connections can create a support network that can mean the difference between isolation and community, scarcity and abundance, despair and hope. Together, you can pool resources, share tasks, and provide mutual support. But remember, trust is paramount in these connections, so choose wisely. In tandem with building alliances, it's time to start implementing sustainable practices. If you're in a situation where the crisis is likely to last, it's essential to think about self-reliance. Start with the basics like water and food, Rainwater collection systems can provide a renewable supply of water. If you have access to a safe outdoor space, consider starting a basic garden. Even a small patch of land can yield a surprising amount of food with the right care and management. Don't forget about other essentials like heat and light. Firewood collection, solar power systems, or other alternative energy sources can be invaluable in a long-term crisis scenario. Lastly, remember that long-term survival is as much about mental and emotional resilience as it is about physical survival. Stay positive, keep your mind active, and remember to take time for self-care. By the end of day three, you should be well on your way towards establishing a sustainable survival plan. The road ahead may be long and challenging, but with preparation, resilience, and a strong community, you have the tools to not only survive, but to build a new normal in the face of adversity. Surviving a disaster is as much a mental game as it is a physical one. When the world around you is in chaos, maintaining a calm, problem-solving attitude can be your greatest asset. Panic and stress can cloud your judgment, leading to hasty decisions that may put you at risk. Instead, focus on the task at hand, strategize, and prioritize. Every problem has a solution. On the flip side, your physical condition is equally crucial. Even in the face of a crisis, don't ignore the basics. Keep yourself hydrated and energized. Your ability to carry out essential tasks, from building a shelter to gathering food, depends on your physical stamina. Engage in regular exercise and follow a balanced diet to maintain your strength. 
Remember, your mental and physical states can greatly influence your ability to survive a disaster. So keep your mind clear and your body ready, because survival isn't just about what you have, it's about what you do and how you think. These first 72 hours can truly determine your survival. When disaster strikes, time becomes the most vital resource, and every decision you make carries weight. The initial three days are often the most chaotic and uncertain, making your actions during this period crucial. In the wake of a crisis, your immediate response and the subsequent steps you take can significantly influence your ability to cope with the aftermath. From assessing the situation to ensuring personal safety, communication, securing basic needs to long-term survival planning, every action counts. The first 72 hours are your opportunity to establish a strong foundation for enduring the crisis. By taking decisive, informed actions, you not only safeguard your immediate well-being, but also set the stage for facing the challenges that lie ahead. Stay safe, stay prepared, and remember every second counts.